Hi everyone, I'm Ashley Bassett. And I'm Katherine Logan. And today we're very excited to introduce you to a brand new type of episode called Game Plan. We've been doing this podcast now for over two years. And during that time, we've had more and more of our patients listening to our podcast episodes to learn more about their condition, what treatment options there are, um, what they have to choose from, and what to expect from surgery. So we decided to create some episodes specifically for our patient population to hopefully answer some of the questions they have about the most common sports medicine conditions and surgical treatments. So what better way to start off than with the ACL, specifically the question we get asked all the time, which is, what graft should I choose to reconstruct my ACL? Totally. All right, so please note this episode is only going to focus on ACL reconstruction. For more information on ACL rehab, we did do a recent two-part episode with Candace Cox back in April of this year. We also cover the addition of LET or lateral extraarticular tenodesis to ACL reconstruction in an overtime episode that was in November of 2021, and we did that with Dr. Brian Waterman live at the AOS meeting back in March of this year. So we're going to have a mini episode coming out on ACL repair. So if you're interested in learning more about the bear, stay tuned for that. Awesome. So before we dive into the graft options for ACL reconstruction, it's worthwhile noting uh, what the ACL is and what a tear presents like. So the ACL or the anterior cruciate ligament is a ligament that runs diagonally in the center of the knee. It attaches the femur or the thigh bone to the tibia or the shin bone. And the ACL has two main roles. It prevents the tibia or the shin bone from sliding anteriorly or forward. And it also contributes rotational stability. And those two functions are critical to allow our patients to to get back to cutting and pivoting sports. And when patients with an ACL tear typically come to our office, it's usually after a twisting injury of their knee. They will often say, hey, I heard a pop and I had this immediate onset of swelling and difficulty walking. They're Sometimes they're able to go back into the game, but oftentimes they're unable to continue playing and they just have difficulty bearing weight on that limb. While we often speak about the non-contact mechanism injury because that's where we can potentially decrease with our ACL prevention programs, the most common mechanism of injury remains contact, either from another player or with the ground. So we're going to show you an MRI picture, um, and it's usually required to confirm the diagnosis and assess for associated injuries. So associated injuries could be you know, meniscus, cartilage, or other ligaments. Exactly. So you saw our MRI picture there. So you meet with Catherine or me for an MRI review. Unfortunately, it's not the news you were hoping for. It is an ACL tear. And now we're talking about surgery, specifically ACL reconstruction. So what do we use to reconstruct the ACL? So graft options can broadly be divided into two main groups. Autograph, which is using the patient's own tissue, bone patellar tendon bone or BTB, quad tendon and hamstring tendon are those three options. And then allograph, which is cadaver tissue. And that comes from a human donor. Allograft options are much more expansive. They include the same three, BTB, quad tendon, and hamstring, but they also have additionally Achilles tendon, anterior and posterior tibialis tendon. So let's start off our discussion today with allograft options. So allograft or any graft, I always tell my patients that there's pros and cons to any choice you're going to make. Mm -hmm. So when you're considering allografts so from the cadaver, the primary benefit is that you have a lack of what we call donor site morbidity or issues associated um, where we harvested that graft. So with an allograft, you're not robbing Peter to pay Paul. So you don't have any kneeling pain. There's no risk of fracture of the kneecap. Um, and we don't hear people complaining about a lot of anterior knee pain or strength de deficits in their hamstring. The other benefits is that you have smaller and fewer surgical incisions. There's decreased surgery time often, and sometimes there's decreased cost. But lastly, there are many allograft options and sizes, which decreases the reliance on quantity and quality of that host tissue. So this is particularly beneficial when doing a revision surgery, as the previous tunnel size can limit your graft options. So Catherine nicely talked about all the pros, and there are a lot of pros, but what about the cons? So yes, there is a risk of disease transmission with any donor tissue. However, with modern sterilization techniques, the risk of disease transmission from a donor to a recipient is exceptionally low. It's less than one in 1.8 million last time I checked the literature. And yes, there's slower graft incorporation due to a less robust healing response, but the biggest downside of allograft use that we all talk about as surgeons is the increased risk of graft rupture and need for revision ACL surgery compared to the use of autograft tissue. So that would make you say, 
then why do we ever use allograft tissue? Well, for that answer, we have to go to the data. Short answer is the elevated risk of graft rupture really depends on two things, the patient's age and the patient's activity level. So Catherine, in terms of, you know, you have a, a patient, let's pick an arbitrary age of 45, uh, and they have an ACL tear. Are you talking to this patient about allograft reconstruction? Do you have an age cutoff? in terms of patients you indicate for allograft or is it based on other factors? I basically don't have a cutoff per se, but I will say once someone's on the other side or the north side of 40, I generally say, look, the data is such that it's hard for me to tell you you have to do autograft, but here's the pros and cons and we'll go into what you know what's good about autograft. But from my perspective, once you get to over 40, even if you're a very active individual, it really becomes the patient's choice. So I feel like my job is to tell you all the risks, the pros, the cons of all those options. But when you look at the data, and as we show and share this um, chart with you, what we know is that as we get older, the risk of re-tear, which is really the most important thing we think about. So anytime we're doing these you know, graft pro and cons side by side, everything has a con, everything has, you know, lots of great pros, but at the end of the day, what do we care about most? It's, are we gonna be here again in a year? And so I think when you think about, are you gonna re-tear this, that data, once you get on the north side of 40, it's really hard to tell a patient, yes, you have to do that. But I do, I would say I have plenty of people that still choose autograft at that age. What about you? Is, you know, similar discussion or do you sort of frame it a little bit different, Ashley? No, very similar discussion. I, I quote the age of 35 based on that paper and that chart you were talking about, which which we will show here. Um, but yes, I, I routinely kind of use closer to 40. Also, sometimes when I talk to patients and I explain this comes from a cadaver, we could use your own tissue. Some patients just feel more comfortable using their own tissue. And especially with some of the graft options, one of the newer graft options, which we'll talk about in a little bit, donor site morbidity is a little lower. So I think that is an appealing option to some patients. Um, I also look at their activity level. I know out in Colorado, you have a ton of high level people, tons of skiers. So I tell people, you know, if you're 45, but you're a black diamond skier, you ski every weekend that you possibly can, maybe we should be considering autograph. I know that doesn't go with the data. There, there was one paper looking at military personnel up to the age of, I think, 40 or 42, and they also had a higher rate of graph failure with allograft. So I don't think we can just be looking at uh, people's age. You also have to be looking at their physiologic age, right? How old are they acting? How much stress are they putting on their knee? So I talk about those two options with patients, and I, I let them decide based on the data. I think you're totally right. And I can like bubble up like multiple sort of patient examples in my mind where, you know, they're 50 years old, crazy fit, want to do everything that Colorado, you know, sort of provides us. And they will say, you know, just immediately, I don't want to use a cadaver. I want my own tissue. I know I have good tissue or whatever. And we get into the OR and I, you know, the first thing I think is they are not wrong. You know, they're you know, yeah. their tissue is yeah. excellent. It's really high quality. It's almost like if I'm doing quad tendon, I swear it's like, skin tendon there's like i'm like where's yeah. your fat layer <laughs> you <don't have> <laughs> so um exactly. you know I, I i agree like you have to really look at the patient as an individual and our job is really to say yep here are your options um and that said the other side of the coin is i have plenty of people who you know say they're 45 48 and they say there's no way i'm totally using cadaver <laughs> like yes you know they exactly. don't want to go through any sort of donor site morbidity so Exactly. Yeah, when I, I talk about like less pain um, and I don't want to say quicker post-op recovery, but yeah. like they feel like they're recovering quicker because of that less pain. They get back their motion like almost immediately, yeah. you know, their pain levels low. They're off of pain medications almost immediately. And I, I tell that to people and there's a lot of people that say, oh, OK, well, if I'm yes, not a black yes. diamond skier, if I'm not playing semi pro soccer, then, you know, maybe maybe I can do OK with the cadaver and just have a kind of an easier go of it, you know, and that's that's not wrong either. No, 100%. Okay, so we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about revisions because um, revisions are a big part of anyone who's doing um, high volume ACL practice. So we'll discuss a little bit about the MARS paper. Obviously, we want this to be very patient centric, so we're not going to dive too far into the details. But um, with revision ACL, are you using allograft? Are you using autograft? And Ashley, how do you make that decision? Yeah, so that, that paper you mentioned, the Mars paper, I think it's really important because it showed, um, they looked specifically at revisions uh, and they looked at using BTB um, autograph versus allograph and they found a higher rate of failure 
with allograft use, but the median age in that study was 26. So if you go back to all the stuff we just said before, which is if yeah. someone's under the age of 35, they have a higher rate of failure with allograft, that doesn't change just because it's a revision. So I think that paper made sense to me. So I think it's tempting sometimes to say, you know, well, this is a revision. You've already had your autograph. Here's your allograph. But people are having ACLs younger and younger. I mean, 14 year olds, 13 year olds are having their primary ACL reconstruction. If they're having a revision in their late teens, early 20s, they still should yeah. get autograph tissue. And so I think the paper nicely highlights that. So to answer your question, yes, I am using allograph, um, but I'm, I'm again only using it over the age of 35 to 40 after a discussion with the patient. It's not just a, a knee jerk thing for all revisions. Um, what about you? Same. Like, honestly, I've never sort of trained under anyone or sort of been practicing around anyone that did the knee jerk, let's go to allograph now. Mm -hmm. So that was sort of like a foreign concept to me. Like I always felt like age um, and activity level were the most important things and mm -hmm. that, you know, anybody I trained with, and I think Ashley, the same for you, you know, if they're in their twenties and they have a failure, you know, obviously you're also looking for other things. Why did they fail? Um, mm -hmm. You know, are we sort of missing out other reasons? So we're not going to do a deep dive into that today, but <laughs> <laughs> um, as far as graph choice, it was always like, okay, do we want to, we did BTB. Now do we want to do hamstrings? Do we want to do contralateral BTB? Like it was always like, there are other options for autographs. So I'm with you. I think on that age where the mean was 26 years old, I'm still going autographed all the way. Absolutely. And when you are choosing allograph, what are you using primarily for your allograft tissue? So for me, if I'm using allograft, I use posterior tibialis. Um, so for me, it's a nice soft tissue graft. Um, the, the size, I think, um, is really something that you can easily get the size or the diameter of the graft. Um, and so if you do have a larger tunnel that you're dealing with in a revision setting that you need to make up that sort of space for, you're never worried about, is this going to be big enough in diameter or, um, you know, plenty of real estate there. So I've been really happy with that graft, um, but full disclosure, it doesn't come up that much. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's still more of an autograph population, but, um, mm -hmm. and then Ashley, I think you've told me before that you'll use the BTB, um, for your allograph. So are you happy with that? Do you like that? Yeah. So I, this is what I love about our, our podcast and getting to chat with you about this stuff because it just, you see a different way of approaching things. So posterior tibialis, I I have not used that for allograft and I, in my practice, people aren't routinely using that, but it sounds like a great graft option, especially if you're doing primarily suspensory fixation and especially with the um, variability in size or being able to tailor the size. That sounds awesome. Um, I primarily use patellar tendon allograft mostly because it's how I was trained. Um, so in my fellowship, that's the allograft that was being used. And also I do a lot of BTB autographs. So it's a graph that's comfortable in my PA's hands. Uh, it's comfortable in my hands. I do the exact same fixation for the autograph BTB as I do the allograph BTB. The one thing I will say, and this is a little outside the realm of like a patient discussion, but definitely our surgeons listening in, I think will will understand this, that a lot of times the graft measurements are a little off. So the patellar tendon will say, oh, it's 40 or 45, and it ends up being a lot longer. And then you worry about graft tunnel mismatch. And so I have been starting to lean towards doing Achilles tendon allograph. You get the bone block, which I think is really beneficial. And you don't have to worry about having too long of a tendon that creates issues with fixation along the tibial side. So started to make that shift. Nice um, but I, li I like the bone block option. Yeah, no, agree. All good options. Nice. So hopefully we now have a better understanding of the pros and cons of when are you going to use allograft for ACL reconstruction? When is that beneficial? Um, so we want to be clear, we both use allograft. Um, it does have a role in ACL reconstruction. Surgeons and patients just need to understand like when is that um, when is that clinical scenario relevant and when is it most appropriate? Yeah, I think, Catherine, I think that's really important. And this is where I'm going to make like a PSA to all the patients that are listening. Sometimes I will hear people in the community and, and not talking badly about anyone in, in particular or anyone, period, but, you know, who's in their 20s and they're being told they should have an allograph. ACL reconstruction. We know the data doesn't support that. And so a lot of times, just because what people have practiced over the years, it doesn't necessarily mean that's the best standard of care currently. So I really encourage patients to, to kind of ask these questions, talk about the different graft options, do your research and, and ask your surgeon what they do primarily, what they feel comfortable with and, and what the risks and benefits of the options are. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Um, all right. So let's move on to autograft um, for ACL reconstruction. Um, and then once, you know, we do decide on autograph, there's, I always outline it as like, there's three options that you can choose from that all have good, good data. 
you know, so we have, um, and we'll highlight with our picture here that there's bone patella, tendon bone, or a lot of times we'll talk about it as being BTB. Um, there's quadriceps tendon and there's hamstrings, hamstrings tendon. When you go to orthopedic conferences, there's always going to be a lot of debate about which one is ideal. Um, and these debates have gone on for decades. And I think at the end of the day, what that always sort of tells me, if you have a lot of surgeons fighting for <laughs> why um, they are the best graft, that means they probably are all very good options. So just knowing exactly. how, you know, the pros and cons in each and how that applies to the individual patient is really the best way to go. But those three graphs are all really good graphs. So with that in mind, let's just talk about all three of them. Um, and Ashley, why don't you kick it off, talk a little bit about hamstring. Absolutely. So hamstring tendon, most of the literature focuses on comparing hamstring tendon to BTB. So that's how we're going to approach it today. So pros of hamstring tendon include um, improved quad strength post-op because you're not compromising uh, the extensor mechanism by either taking the quadriceps tendon or the patellar tendon, less post-op knee stiffness, and a lower risk of knee arthritis in some studies. But the biggest benefit of hamstring tendon is that it avoids the significant donor site morbidity and issues that we see with BTB harvest. And those include, Catherine listed them earlier, I'll list them again here today, uh, anterior knee pain and numbness, kneeling pain, that risk of patellar fracture, both intraoperatively as well as postoperatively if patients were to fall, um, and patellofemoral arthritis. Again, that last one is in some studies, and not all studies have shown it has clinical significance, just a radiographic finding, but still important to know. Yeah. So, I mean, all these things sound great. So what's the downside as everything has a downside? So there's many concerns regarding the use of the hamstring tendon, um, but here are like the big three. So the big three um, is size, so graph size. The way I word it to patients is, you are born with the hamstrings you're born with, I can't make them any bigger. <laughs> That's, <laughs> so, great. That's a great um, comment. <laughs> Hamstring tendon size has a lot of variability. You can also have your surgeon look at it on MRI and try to make an estimate but it requires like a very specific sort of cut on the MRI for it to be accurate. So that's not perfect in its own right. It really depends on um, the ability of that MRI facility to do that right sort of um, study, let's say. So not always possible to get an accurate um, measurement of what your hamstring is in diameter. Um, so hamstring grafts less than 8.5 millimeters in diameter have a significantly higher rate of graft failure. Um, and a higher rate of need for like revising. So basically they have a higher rate of failing and you needing to get surgery again. Um, there was a time where surgeons were adding allograft um, to a smaller hamstring tendon. So having a little bit of a combo of you have autograft and allograft and thinking, okay, well this will make up in the size and we can get it larger in diameter if we kind of bundle them together. Um, but this has, does not actually negate the risk. And in some studies, it'll show a higher failure rate when you do this sort of combo. Um, the second thing we think about is hamstring weakness. So there's concerns about compromising hamstring strength in the population where hamstring weakness is thought to predispose the ACL injury in the first place. So it's a, a real concern to consider. And then graft failure. So an elevated risk of graft failure with the use of hamstring tendon compared to BTB has been found in many studies. Um, this difference is small. It's not like a really large difference, um, but it, you know, important to sort of know it is statistically significant, which means, um, you know, it does matter. So, so on the topic of graft failure, it bears mentioning that several recent studies have demonstrated a significantly higher rate of graft failure after ACL reconstruction with hamstring autograft in females, particularly those under the age of 20. There's been a couple studies recently that came out and showed that, and they think this may be related to hamstring size. There have been a lot of anatomic studies that have looked at hamstring size in females, and they are significantly smaller than those of males. And there was another study that came out looking at um, failure rates in hamstring ACLs and found that 90% of female patients that underwent a hamstring ACL reconstruction had graft size of less than 8.5 millimeters, which as Catherine just nicely highlighted, having a, a graft size of less than 8.5 millimeters leads to a higher risk of failure. So you want to try to avoid that. And once they're that small, adding allograft is not going to save you there. So no. yeah, exactly. So Catherine, I know we both take care of a lot of female athletes. Obviously, these findings about graft yeah. size, higher rate of failure, and then hamstring weakness, which predisposes to non-contact ACLs to start with, just really pushes me further away from hamstring tendon. But what are your thoughts? Are you doing ever doing hamstring autograph? Are you staying away from it? 
I would say it's rare. And the, the time that I'm doing a hamstring, it really is about like something very unique. Mm -hmm. um, so they've already had a failure. They already, you know, have taken the quad or they've already taken the BTB. They don't want to go to the contralateral extremity um, to take a graft. So like the, the other knee to take a graft. Um, another really strange one was someone who had... Um, osteochondroma. So they have these bony tumors that were in the way of like, you know, basically they had already damaged part of their extensor mechanism, their quad tendon. And, you know, some really unique reasons why I'm taking a hamstring. Um, so it's really just not a big part of my practice at this point. Yeah. So it sounds sort of similar for you. I know we both see yeah. a lot of young females. Um, so these studies make right. it harder and harder to convince us to do it. I completely agree. Yeah. I, I think um, before quad was gaining popularity and had data to support it, I would be doing hamstring autographs sometimes in skeletally immature patients that still could be um, transficeal, which for our listeners means drilling through the growth plate. After a certain age, it is safe to drill through the growth plate and not damage it. Um, and you, you don't still want to put a piece of bone like BTB across that growth plate. So I was using hamstring tendon at that time, but now that there's quad as a really robust soft tissue graft, I really don't. I think, as you said, unique patient yeah. scenarios, they had a hamstring on the other side, they're insistent that they have it on yeah. this side, things like that. But otherwise I'm not, I'm not doing the hamstring autograph. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. So then moving on to BTB, which we kind of talked about a little bit by default and talking about all the downsides of hamstring tendon and kind of consequently the benefits of BTB, but let's talk a little bit more about some of those benefits. So faster graft incorporation is something that's been seen primarily in the animal studies. So six weeks for the bone block versus age 12 weeks for soft tissue graft. But again, that's just animal studies for our listeners. Better objective knee stability, so less um, post-op pivot shift, which is the test to see the stability of the knee after surgery and the Lachman test as well. And then in some studies, a greater ability to return to pre-injury level of play as well. Yeah, I think... Um, the studies we were referencing to about the better return to play were all compared to hamstring. Exactly. Um, and, yeah. So, and we'll, you know, make sure we have um, links to those in our show notes um, if we forget to say that already. Mm -hmm. um, but so I think, you know, that's sort of the data that kind of also additionally pushed me away from hamstring. Um, but I think that BTB, I always feel is a really great option. Um, even when I'm talking about BTB versus quad, which we haven't hit yet, I think they're both great options. And I sort of speak about them equally to patients and then just talk a little bit more about the downsides. I would say uh, my experience, like with the post-op and the females, the thing I sort of emphasize is, you know, sometimes people do have anterior knee pain that lags um, and kind of hangs on for a little bit. Um, so that's something to sort of consider, especially if they already had it, if they had it as a teen and now they're in their twenties and they say, oh, I have anterior knee pain or patella pain all the time when I run. And, you know, so that makes me a little bit more nervous about doing that um, in a younger female. But ultimately I tell them at the end of the day, what do we care about? We care about, is this going to happen again? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, you know, everything else is just a little bit of patient preference, but you know, at the end of the day, it's a great graph for, is this going to happen again? Is this going to re-tear? I just think some of the downtime is really the kneeling pain. Um, you know, the fracture risk should be extremely low. It's mm -hmm. really just thinking about, is that anterior knee pain something that's already haunted me? And I'm now worried that this is going to flare up. Yeah. So I think if you were to just kind of tune in and hear, yeah. you may think that both of us don't use BTV a lot because- yeah. A lot of times when we talk about BTB, we talk about all the downsides, right? Because they're, they're major downsides. I tell patients, it's not you may have kneeling pain. It's you will have kneeling pain. Yeah. You can work on that with therapy. Candice talked really nicely about desensitization of kneeling. I was just talking to a patient about that the other day. So you can get there, but it, it is going to hurt. You're going to have numbness in the front of the knee. You may have patellar tendonitis when you you know transition sports. There, there's These are very real risks. And I see a lot of patients for second opinions where their original surgeon never told them about this. So I think it's important to counsel patients about this. But I think as you so nicely highlighted, I think it's a great graph. And so I, I don't want to speak for you, but I'm using primarily BTB for my primary ACLs in my young athletes, unless as you highlighted, there's a contraindication for doing that. 
Yeah, I would say if you look at me statistically, I'm still more quad, but I'm still okay. very pro BTV, if that makes sense. That so does. I think like I've had a lot of great outcomes with quad, have been very happy with like their rehab. But if they sort of ask me like, you know, is one better than the other? Like my answer is they're both great. You mm -hmm. know, like the, I would just say the female population, especially in this um, and even males too, like people have been very happy with it, with returning to ski um, and, you know, just sort of like these back countries, sort of high level sort of skiers who are doing a lot of jumping, you know, they just feel like they're, the initial concern was, for me was like, are they going to be able to get their full quad strength back? And they really do. Um, and I think yeah. if they're sort of hitting the mountain really hard, they're happy that they're not getting any sort of patella pain. But Excellent. So at the end of the day, when they ask me my opinion, I'm like, they're both very good. You know, like and that's and that's good. It's running. good to have multiple yeah. options and allow the patient to choose. And I'm sure you're in this situation where sometimes I give them all these options and then they look at me blankly and say, just Which make the decision say? for yeah. me. I, I don't want this on my plate. And I totally get that. But it is nice to have a variety of options to choose from. So I think everything I love, you just said, oh, go on. Yeah. Oh, no, I was going to say, I think so. Part of um, the rise of like quad also happened at the children's hospital here. Mm -hmm. So with um, Dr. Albright, he was doing a lot and he probably, I, you know, I don't know what the statistics are like in um, pediatric, like ACL centers across the country, like who has done the most, but he's definitely been doing them for a really long time and doing them really well. So as that has kind of gotten out into the community, I think, you know, what you also see is more and more people be like, my friend had a quad, my friend had a quad, my friend mm -hmm. had a quad. They're very happy, you know? So I, I do think sometimes you get these like regional mixes, just like we still have pockets of the country that still do all hamstring. Yep, so absolutely. I think, you know, you do get those little bit of regional differences, but I would attribute yeah. just like, you know, without knowing the exact numbers, I would attribute that a little bit to what happened um, with the successful sort of outcomes com coming out of the pediatric population for like over a decade. Absolutely. Well, I think this nicely kind of segues us yeah. into our third and final graft option, which is the quadriceps tendon. We've kind of already been talking about it. So it is the newest option of the three grafts, um, and it can be harvested either as an all soft tissue graft um, using a minimally invasive technique or an open incision or yeah. with a bone block from the patella or the kneecap. Um, and while the quad tendon is the least commonly used autograph for ACL reconstruction currently, there are many advantages over both BTB and hamstring autograph, which again, we kind of just alluded to. Mm -hmm. So quad tendon has been shown to result in less anterior knee pain, numbness, kneeling pain, and it has a lower risk of patellar fracture in quad free tendon harvest without the bone plug. So, um, Catherine, we kind of talked about it yeah. there, but I didn't get a chance to ask you in terms of your quads, are you doing primarily all soft tissue? Do you occasionally take a bone block? What's your approach to it? So primarily all soft tissue at this point, but what I do, um, is first assess. So we know that the length of the graft is very important. So in the beginning, I was wondering, am I always going to get the length I want? So I did start with the bony block and I always found that I just had so much length. It just, it wasn't necessary, but mm -hmm. I still do a little bit of a measurement before I actually take the graft and make sure I'm very, very happy with the length. So if I don't think that they're going to have enough length, I will take a bony block, but for the most part, soft tissue. So the thing um, I always tell, like we're sort of talking a little bit about cons, like what are the cons of this graft? What I generally tell people is in your early sort of physical therapy, if you are sitting on a table next to someone who had a hamstring graft, they are going to be crushing like straight leg raises and lifting their leg off the table and you are not. Like <laughs> you're just yeah. gonna, like, I've injured your quad. I've now taken part of your quad tendon and I've stitched it up. You have stitches in your quad. It's not going to want to fire, but it will, you know? So mm -hmm. I think that's an important thing to know is that early quad firing is tough. Absolutely. And I think another thing that I always warn my patients is stiffness. So for some reason in the early phase, um, they tend to get a little bit stiff. I'm not sure if it's some of that super patellar pain, some of that scarring in that area, but they get a little bit stiff. I'm just a little more on them in terms of getting back their motion, really making sure that they hit their every two week range of motion goals um, and making sure we up the PT if they need um, a bit more assistance with that. And then I don't know about you, I do BFR for all my ACL reconstructions, but I definitely use it um, for my quad tendon ACLs. I make sure they're going to a PT who does BFR to make sure that we're really trying everything possible to get that quad 
activated and to get that quad bulking up as soon as possible. Yeah, for sure. No, 100% agree. Big fan of BFR for any graft. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we talked about that a lot. Awesome. So to quickly review, because we went through a lot today, so we just want to make sure we're hitting the main points. So to quickly review, ACL reconstruction, graft choice, it has been studied extensively. And as Catherine nicely pointed out, if something has been studied this extensively and there's still this many surgeons fighting about it, it likely means that you're going to be fine um, with, with whichever graft choice um, your surgeon recommends to you, as long as it fits your lifestyle, your age, and everything we kind of talked about. So it's still controversial, but to highlight a few main points, we just really want to drive home. So allograft, it is a viable option for revisions and primary ACLs, but in patients younger than the age of 35. Sorry, I'm going to restart that. Hang on. So allograft is a very viable option. It really is. I think a lot of times it gets some negative press, but it is a really good graft option for both revision and primary ACLs but in patients over the age of 35, based on what the data is showing. So patients under the age of 35 or those of very high activity level should probably still be considering an autograph ACL. Um, Retail rate increases dramatically under the age of 35. Patellar tendon autograph has a slightly lower graft failure rate compared to hamstring tendon, but more donor site morbidity, more pain at that, um, at the anterior knee, uh, numbness, kneeling pain, kind of everything we highlighted before. And so quad tendon is a newer autograph that has less donor site morbidity than patellar tendon and less graft size concerns than hamstring tendon, especially in females. So that's particularly exciting for Catherine and I's population. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, ultimately graft choice should be decided between you and your surgeon. Um, you want to think about what are your individual um, things that are most important, what bothers you about the pros and cons of each choice, but then also what is your surgeon most comfortable with? You want to make sure you're going to a surgeon that that is the graph they do routinely so that you have a great outcome. So we recommend that patients just have an honest conversation with your surgeon about the activities that, that you like to do. You know, for example, like, are you kneeling a lot? You know, do those sort of concerns mm -hmm bother you? Is that part of sort of your job or your daily sort of like activities? Um, and what kind of athletic activities do you want to get back to? There's a big difference between wanting to return to run or do the elliptical, or if you're going to go to some sort of high level um, backcountry skiing. So all things to think about, but there's lots of good options. I think it's really the, the main sort of message. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to our first ever game plan episode. We hope you enjoyed our conversation today. Make sure to follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you get your podcasts to ensure that you never miss an episode. If you like what you hear, please consider leaving us a review. You can also reach us by email at thesportstockspod at gmail.com or find us on Instagram at thesportstockspod. We love your feedback.